No, you're That's fine. Awesome. You're fine. <laughs> All right, everybody out there, this is Doc G. This is uh, an incredible interview I've got coming for you right now. We're actually going to be on the live on the Roku channel, live on Help the Radio, live on uh, my my Facebook channel, my YouTube channel, everywhere. Wow. But this is this is going to be super incredible. I've got the wonderful and great Pepe Castro. And partially naked. The, yeah, partially naked. The man that's been in... <laughs> How many bands? Five bands, starting in Blues Magoos in the '60s, oh all the way up to Balance and other bands you know, in between. You know, I'd walk it. I'd walk it around to the pool there, the the, uh, the area. I don't know if you can see it, the pool area. This is on the intracoastal in in Florida. Beautiful. There's yeah, nothing beautiful. but women out there. Number one now, so that's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know how that happens to me, but um, but if I walk too far away, I may lose the I may lose the signal with the Wi-Fi. So. Uh, so I'm going to stay close. But, yes, I'm in sunny Florida. I've wow. been back and forth to New York seven times this year. So I'm still uh, I'm still enjoying it, you know. I'm going to – I'm just going to uh, – you know, I hope I don't lose you. I think I'm going to get my key and go inside. But let's see if I'm still on here. Am I still on? You're still on right now. All right. Well, then I'm, uh, I'm going <laughs> to cop a seat in the sun and, uh, and, and have a good moment. All right. So, yeah, so – I lost you. I knew it. I freaking knew it. I did lose you. Come back, Peppy. Please come back. <laughs> Am I still with you? I lost you for a little bit, but you're, oh. I think I don't have a uh, video. I have audio. Now I lost that too. Come back, Peppy. Just click on the link again and come back in. It, it, it's no big deal. Uh, but people, I, I got to tell you, this, this, this gentleman I'm talking to, he says he's 72. He's he's sprite. He's moving around. He's in sunny Florida. He's enjoying the weather there. And he's just having a ball. We're live on the Roku channel too, guys. So I just want to tell you that. I'll put put us on here so you can see it. But Pepe will be back in just a minute. We had a little problem with scheduling. That's probably my fault. It happens all the time. Um, but I'm very excited to have this gentleman with us here. Just get this on for you. So we will be live. Yeah, there we Me are. Too. Okay, there we are. Okay, we're live audio and video on the Roku channel. And you guys know that we're also live on HamiltonRadios.com. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll be able to view the Roku channel live what we're doing live right there on hamiltonradios.com many things coming out soon too um a lot of things in the works business programs business pro uh, proceeds th different things working with different businesses and companies um hamilton radio is just on its way up not on its way down on its way up we're still striving to be the best we're still striving for everything for everybody and working on our way up the latter. Hopefully we get Peppy back very soon, but Peppy will be back here talking about his many, many careers in all the different bands. We're going to talk about a little bit of his bands. He Barnaby by was one of his bands. We're going to talk about that. Balance was a great band as well. Um, he, he's been with so many damn bands. Um, he's also going to be with um, uh, different people in different bands coming in the future. So he's, he's not done yet. He's definitely not done yet. He's like a uh, uh, child of the 60s, man of the 80s, uh, senior of the 80s, 90s, uh, the 2000s. I don't know. But anyway, I give this man a lot of credit to do what he has to do. Jimmy Ashenbender says, hi, Peppy. Uh, I don't know if you know Jimmy. Jimmy's uh, with the Outsiders, good guitar player and a, a great, great band. The Outsiders coming out with new stuff, too. Um, I, I just love, I love the ability to bring people together and hopefully when we get Peppy back, we can talk about that. But his, his idea of music, uh, to me with the blues Magoos, oh my God, Jimmy, can you imagine, um, blues Magoos without, without Peppy? You just can't, right? Cause it, it's like, you're part of the, he's part of the whole makeup of everything. And, um, yeah, it's, I just, again, I can't wait for him to, um, come back soon so we can talk to him. He's in sunny Florida guys. And, um, 
He's going up to his room right now. We're going to talk to him in a couple minutes, have a little uh, little sit down with him. But balance, I was just telling him, I said, I really love that song, Breaking Away. I mean, I when I heard that song, the first thing I thought was, why is that a lost song? Why is that a song that not everybody plays? I play that song probably more often than others. But it doesn't mean that I'm the only one to play it. Oh, hi, Deborah. Deborah Milstein, how are you, dear? How are you doing? I'm talking to Pepe, Mil uh, Pepe Castro soon. He was just here. He'll be back again in a few minutes. Um, I know you love Pepe. I want you to comment, Deb. I want you to, you know, talk about your stuff too. Um, because, you know, I always try to include everybody in, in my, uh, my ability to interview people and, and talk about things, but I've got so many things going on. Uh, Pepe, you'll be back hopefully very soon. And, um, I am just so super excited, super excited to be with you guys today, uh, to talk to Pepe. Like I said, we had a little, uh, clash with our schedules. Um, I've been trying to get some people for like weeks and months and years. <laughs> and it's, it's been really, really tough. COVID's made it kind of a little bit easier. Some, some a little tougher, some a little easier. Um, but I thank Deborah for this because Deborah got me in touch with Pepe um, to do this. And I was, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, let's do this. <laughs> you know, I look at, I look at life like, if you got an opportunity to do something, you do it. If you got an opportunity to interview somebody like Liberty DeVito last week, Pepe Castro this week, you do it. You don't sit there and go, well, I don't think I have time. No, you have time. You find the time, you make the time and you do it because this, this, these are parts of life that you're never going to get back ever again. Right. You, these, these are the things that, we do as entertainers and people in the entertainment business that other people say, wow, look at this guy go. Well, no, it's not that. It's just that look. I look at life in a different way. You know, Pepe 72. God bless him. God bless him. He looks great. He's probably going to sound great. You know, other people I know probably don't. But that, that's okay because not everybody is Pepe Castro. Not everybody is Jimmy Ashenbender. Not everybody is Doc G. Not everybody is Deborah Milstein. We're all our own people. And, yeah, you're right, Deb. It does. You're 100% you're right. She says it sucks. But this doesn't have to be the end of your career. This could be the beginning or a rebirth of the new career or a part of the old career revised. You never have to look at things as a as a thing going down. You have to look at things, okay, we had a little problem, a little issue. We'll take care of that and smack it and go right back up. Because life is not about life is not about what you sit and contemplate about. Life is about what you do at this very moment in time and, and how it affects you in the future, which could be in the next hour, three hours, two days, year four or five, 10 years, doesn't matter. The, the significance of doing what you need to do to make yourself who you are and where you need to be is, is exactly what everybody needs. Thank you, Deb. I appreciate that. And, you know, again, I, I hope he comes back. Um, he said he was probably going to lose me. He was, <laughs> he was right. But all he has to do is click on the link again, and he's in. So let's see if he comes back really quick. All right, he's trying to get back on now. Um, shoot, I hope he can. I let him know okay. It should let him right back in. As long as he has a good Wi-Fi signal, we should be able to get him in. Um. I have to I, I have to actually wait until he comes back, but I can tell you a little bit about what's going on with us. Here comes Peppy now. Here comes Peppy. Okay. Peppy is back. Okay. I, I came indoors. We're good. <laughs> I got I got two friends for you right away. Jimmy Ashton Benner from the Outsiders. He's actually a good friend of mine now. He knows wow. you. Awesome guy. He's a great they've come out with new music to us uh, with the outsiders. Wow. And Deborah Milstein. Uh 
and she actually got me to you. And she's oh, there. He, he, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Give them both my love. That, that Hopefully they're living, uh, listening in. There you go. She says right there, she loves Peppy. She loves yeah. Peppy. <laughs> and, uh, you know. and Listen, uh, she reintroduced me to, um, oh, my God. Uh, oh, my God. His name just escapes me. Too. I hadn't seen him in 50 years. He was in Blood, Sweat, and Tears and everything. Blood, David Clayton Thomas. No, not David. Oh, uh, the, the other guy. The other guy. The guitarist. Uh, the guitarist. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. And I hadn't seen him in like a half a century or something. <laughs> but we used to pass each other on the street every single day in the village. And I was still trying to catch you up. <laughs> oh, now, oh, my, finally, my, um, I was going to try and get you on my big screen here. So I can see it, but I got you on the cell. I'm not going to lose you now. So no, no, you're good. We're good. We're good. Let, let's just fire away. <laughs> we're good. I and, and, and listen, we're going to just start out with with a couple. Uh, Steve Katz, his name is. She just Steve. Did yes, thank you. Thank she you, Debbie. you that right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> she did because I forgot. I got that short term memory loss since I had a mini stroke a couple of years ago. I, yeah. My wife asked me something the other day, and I'm like, "Honey, I don't really remember. I, I mean, I remember things in the past, but I don't remember." Things that happened like yesterday, the day before, or, or an hour ago. That's because we were there. <laughs> That's probably it. <laughs> Thanks, Steph, for that. And we survived it. Oh, you but know. Peppy, let's let's go through your fantastic oh, career. Come on, let's oh, yeah, go through yeah, your career. Yeah. Starting out at the Blues Magoos, how did you even get in started with playing music? What did you originally do? You know, well, first of all, I left home at fourteen, so. You know, people say, oh you, you, oh, you never graduated high school. I say, no, I never went to high school. <laughs> it's like high school didn't even happen. So that was strange. But, you know, by the grace of God, one day, um, the, uh, some kid showed me how to play an E minor chord on a guitar. And that was it. <laughs> it's like once I did that, I was transfixed. It was like an instant lightning bolt because I realized that I could be a singer and the guy who accompanies the singer all in one person. So when that happened, everything went out the window. M my Olympic mentality and passion for wanting to be that just took over. School went by the wayside, truant officers, the law, everything. <laughs> I really didn't, I, I, I don't know, can my language uh, border on the offense? No, you, listen, no, it's whatever you want to, whatever you want to say. But in all honesty, I didn't give a shit about anything else. Right. other than the passion of music and that's what drove me so by 14 i was like out of my home I, and and then i grew up in the village and and i started you know hitching up with guys who played music um fortunately for me all the other guys were older so i had met two of the magoos at a, an italian feast in the bronx in a place called villa avenue wow and and i saw them up there playing and there was just the three of them and i Went up and said, hey. And I started talking to them. They said, do you play? I said, yeah, well, I, a little. And they said, well, we're looking for a guy you want. And that was Ronnie and Ralph from the Magoos. And we went from there. We were first the trench coats. And then we went from being the trench coats to the Blues Magoos. But, uh, you know, by the grace of God, I, I had my first hit record at 17. So, so who were you, know. you influenced by? Were you influenced by the Beatles, Elvis, and all the, the great? Oh, well, well, my inspirations happened from a lifetime of just listening to the radio. So, you know, it, it was it was rather, uh, you know, rather diverse because playlists back then were just that, you know. There wasn't 20 charts. There was one, you know. Yeah, you're right. And, and, <laughs> and in that one chart, you heard everybody from Benny King to Clyde McFadder to to uh, uh, Chubby Checker, to Rob, Bobby Rydell, to Bobby Darren, you know, on and on and on. So it was really my influences were the songs, you know. Uh, Jimmy Rogers, Kisses Sweeter Than Wine. I mean, oh, oh great my, song. You Still know, a great song. Still I mean, great. all those things filled my head because I emulated anything I heard on the radio. All I wanted to do was sing, you know. So by the time I went, oh, my God, I can be two people and played a chord, and that was it. I begged my mother to get me a cheapo guitar at a pawn shop. And I went out and got a guitar chord book. And, you know, I couldn't even sit in my neighborhood and play around friends or in my apartment um, because everybody just told me I sucked, you know. And and so I just said, you know what? Uh, I can't deal with this. Let me go up in the hill somewhere out in the park and sit by myself where I could just be alone. And, and 
Oh, we lost you, Peppy. Oh, it's going to be one of them interviews. I mean, for incoming call. There we go. Okay, so you know, it was really, uh, it was a blessing. You know, it was it was divine intervention, and then that just took me on my road. You know, and I never, I never looked back. And all of a sudden, now here I am, fifty five years down the road, going, what, <laughs> what, you know. How did how did this happen? Amazing, absolutely. And um, and the great thing is that uh, I, I um I still have stuff coming at me. You know, I have a um a really great thing which I'll announce for you, uh, which I have been keeping very quiet. Uh oh, but uh, there is going to be a new show that comes out called Warhol. And it's the life of Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. And my former manager licensed the exclusive rights from the Warhol Foundation and ended up securing Sir Trevor. Whoops. Oh, we lost you. <laughs> oh, this is going to be this going to be one of them interviews, isn't it, guys? Where Pepe talks, then he goes away. And he comes back, <laughs> he goes away. And stuff happens. He's holding his phone. I think it's his phone, Deb. He, he is, is, um, his phone probably fell. And he's got to call back in again. So just, you know, let, let's, let me reiterate a little bit what he was talking about. Of course, you know, we're talking about his time with the Blues, Blues Magoos and all the other bands that he was with. And we're going to get into all the bands and talk a little bit about that too. It will do whatever Pepe wants to do to make him feel comfortable. But at the same time, I want to make sure we get all the information. And if you guys got questions for him, let me know. I know this is an impromptu interview that usually I do interviews like on, um, you know, like a, a Wednesday at seven o'clock or something like that. But this is an impromptu interview that I'm doing, you know, because uh, Pepe and I, uh, it works better for us this time. Actually, the the time thing was a little issue, but. Okay. So the, back again, <laughs> yeah, Pepe. So that was my fault dropping the phone. <laughs> I wanted to get you on my internet here on my uh, on my computer in the background over there. I guess they have yeah, something like that. I figured this way I don't have to hold the phone. Right. But, okay. So here's the exclusive. So Sir Trevor Nunn is a knight. He's Sir. He's Sir, like Sir Paul McCartney. Right. right. And right. Sir Trevor Nunn uh, directed Cats. He directed Les Mis. Wow. Um, he directed uh, Aida, wrote a lot of the, all the lyrics to Aida, wrote the lyrics to that song, Memories in the Corner of My Mind. Anyway, he's an icon. Wow. So uh, my former manager, who is uh, my partner in a musical I have called Rock and the Planet, is a guy named Steve Lieber. Steve Lieber was um, uh, Lieber Krebs, and they were the kings of the East. They managed, if you're ready for this, they managed Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, Parliament Funkadelics, Golden Earring, Scorpion, Def Leppard, Michael Bolton, Joan Jett, and on and on and on and on. They did Beatlemania. Uh, Steve toured the Moscow Circus four years all over North America. Can you imagine moving 400 Russians all over the all over the globe for four years? So, so Steve is Steve is no slouch. He offers me the opportunity to be involved with Warhol. I have six songs in the show. Nice. Um, it is going to open Thanksgiving uh, uh, in London. Uh, 2021, uh, providing a COVID snap. If, if they have to, they'll push it back uh, to 2022. But the theater's booked. The show's casted. It's written. Uh, we've recorded a lot of the score. They've done some videos. So for me, at my age, <laughs> thinking I was retired, <laughs> you know, sitting outside because I spend my days making music and going to the beach, pretty much, you know, uh, to have that opportunity and, you know, and Andy Warhol, you know, what was his, one of his mantras was like, everybody has their 15 minutes of fame. Correct. Yeah. So, so naturally I have a song in the show called 15 minutes of fame. And, um, and if it all goes the way I interpret it or envision it going, I'm probably going to have another 15 minutes. So, <laughs> you know, so if I'm one of these eclectic guys who've been able to operate under the radar, and have a life and make a buck with d diverse stuff. It's, it's like awesome. it's so it's it's like so funny. I, I I remember like two years ago I did a radio interview, and the and the guy I forget who he is now, but it was it was on the radio. He goes oh, well, we have Pepe Castro here today. Pepe Castro is not a one hit wonder. He's a two hit wonder. You know, 
And I started laughing my ass off. They said, somebody's calling me a two-hit wonder. I'm going, two-hit wonder? I said, oh. I said, oh, I guess you haven't heard about Diana Ross and Cher and Kiss and things like that. You right, know? right. They don't, have the, they don't have a clue. I know. So, you know, but, but that's how the world looks at you. But for me, I, I, how, how can I complain, you know? I mean, it's a, and Warhol's going to be a groundbreaking musical, without a doubt. I have, I have no doubts in it. So to think that I'm, I'm looking at this, you know, going to London in a year or something for, a, you know, an That's opening. Awesome. That's awesome. You know, after these years. But, uh, you know, so anyway, but uh, whatever. Go ahead. Go dig down the psychedelic bag and throw something at me. <laughs> well, the 60s, I got to talk about the Blues Magoo Woo. because the, we ain't got nothing Woo. yet. It's still played. We love it. I mean, that yeah. is a real funk, a funky psychedelic song. Was that intentional at that time because of the the way the era? Oh was? God, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It would we we were in the right place at the right time, you know. I mean, I I like to say that the the music business or success sometimes is a lot of luck, timing, and talent, you know. And we had all three going for us, and we were certainly in the right place at the time. But all that stuff was totally by design. You know, we would, that's who we were. We were immersed in that world. We didn't want to just write normal songs and we didn't want to be, you know, we, sh we um, pushed ourselves to be unique and original and not be a cover nice. band, you right. know, um, because in those days, other than the coffee houses of the village, you could not work or play anywhere else unless you played the bars and you played the cover songs and you were a cover band, you know? Right. So the only avenue you really had back then was to go into the village and hit the coffee houses where, you know, there was no alcohol, but they'd let you get up and sing your own songs, you know? Yeah, so, uh, but that's where the scene was. The scene was in the village and that's where everybody in the business would go to migrate to see any kind of original talent. So that's where we discovered, you know? That he, now the name the Blues Magoo's. Now the only thing I can think of Magoo was Mr. Magoo, which was that guy from. The, yeah, yeah, of course, Jim Backus. Jim Backus. So, was that implied to, or was it? Yeah. No, there was nothing. There was nothing in reference to uh, Jim Backus. I just think you know people looked at us as these guys are. They can't be serious. You know, you know, because look, I mean, we used to walk into radio stations. I used to hairspray my hair, uh, one side gold and the other side silver, you know. <laughs> I mean, we were doing Parliament Funkadelic before they, they even made a record, you know. We were walking in with, you know, I had one pane in in my glasses and one pane out, you know. <laughs> I'd have a bowling shoe and a and a cowboy boot, you know. I mean, we were just not taking ourselves serious, but we were having fun, you yeah, know. Yeah. So I think Magoo's was one of those silly words that rhymed with blues and Magoo's and and you know, it's something it's something that just stuck. And, um, you know, I think we're one of those one hit wonders because of We Ain't Got Nothing Yet. It's just like one of those groundbreaking songs that showed some kind of real decent musicality, you know. In those days, you know, you never heard a record on the radio that was a shuffle, ba -boop, ba -bop, ba -boop, ba -bop. <laughs> you know, you never heard that. You know, you heard that maybe blues clubs and with serious blues songs, right, right, right. and then you never heard. You never heard that kind of minor run, which you know, that wasn't just a kid strumming on a guitar. You know, there was some, there was some, there was some great intelligence in that simple record. I think that telegraphed to people, well, this is really unique, you know, and I think that's why it still gets looked on as one of those classic one hit wonders as opposed to one of the run of the run of the mill one hit wonders you know like a song like i love you for today and yesterday there's tomorrow what was that the spiral case, spiral staircase, staircase. yeah mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that's like you know people consider that a one hit wonder that is one of like the greatest songs i've ever heard in my life you <laughs> it know what is, I mean? it still is yeah <laughs> you know i i mean i love that song to this day i could sing it go out and be very happy just coming that song in my head, you know? It's just like one of those iconic things, you know? And um, and so, you know, and that's where Breaking Away comes in. Even though Breaking Away wasn't a top, it was top 10 most everywhere, but it was a bona fide hit, you know? But um, I have people who I revere 
you know, who are like fabulous, well-known producers. And they come out and go, that's one of my all-time best top 20 songs <laughs> ever, you know? And, you know, that's what makes it a hit to me. You know, the fact that people I revere go like, man, you wrote one of the greatest all-time songs I've ever heard. And you know what? I wrote that song in 20 minutes. Well, you know, Pepe, it's it's not so much it's not so much one hit wonders. I I, I think it's it, what it is is a lack of knowledge from the the public because you know if you if you take like groups like Player in the seventies, they yeah. well, Baby Come Back was the only song. No, they had many many hits. <laughs> really? No, the yes. one hit wonder. No, yes. no, many many hits. Yes, but the go into their discs and see. But the business is McDonald's, you know. Throw it exactly. Up against, throw it Serve up against one. the and, and <laughs> see what it sticks. You know, like okay, and then the and then the business is like fickle. They're like, okay, well, what they do last time out? Oh, they didn't do so well. Next, you know, and then like now here's new beef, chicken, and broccoli. You know. Yeah. So so it, it's 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 that that's what you deal with, and then you get typecast and uh, and thrown in that little box. You know, but I was lucky because I've always reinvented the wheel. I never wanted to become an imitation of myself, you know. So the the different bands I've had and the different things and the musicals and doing hair on Broadway and all that kind of stuff kept me fresh all the time, you know. And so yep. I it's and you know, I'm here. I'm still I'm still <laughs> I'm still I'm still here. I get to I get to talk about myself. <laughs> We're gonna talk about all that stuff, but I wanna talk about your touring. Um, who did you tour with when you were in the Blues Magoos and, and the Balance and, and all the, did you tour with a lot of people, a lot of bands, a lot of people? Well, because the Magoos was, were the 60s and the epic center of what was going on there, um, that touring was diverse and extensive. And one of the great things about it was that uh, in those days, as you know, you know, you didn't walk into a stadium for 500 bucks a ticket to see one act. You know, you went in for 350 right. and you went into uh, um, uh, you went into a civic auditorium and then it was maybe 14 acts or 15 acts and everybody came on and did 20 minutes, you know. And and to me, that was the greatest thing on earth because I would sit. And I was sitting on the side of the stage and being pure heaven because all the people I loved were were there, you know, in real time, you know, like I'd get out on the stage and cream would come on. And oh, then and then Martha awesome. and the Vandellas would come on, you know, <laughs> and then and then the Magoos would come on. And then Wilson Pickett would come on, you know, I like the Murray to KRKO shows. And there was a guy down south named Dan Brennan. I don't know if you ever know. He owned a block of stations all across the south, Birmingham and all that kind of stuff. And if you've got on one of his shows, I mean, you know, I would be out there going, oh, my God, Leslie Gore. Ah, you know, <laughs> mamas and the papas. Yeah, you know? just amazing names. You know, so it was so diverse and it was so musical because nothing was a uh, nothing was cookie cutter. All these songs were so creative and entirely different. You know, the 60s will never be repeated again. Obviously, something different will come up, but by and large, I don't see how anything touches it because it was so diverse. I mean, I used to listen to Manfred Mann and go like, these songs are great. And then I'd look on the album and I'd say, oh, Goffin and King, you know. They were smart enough to go cut songs from great songwriters. Acts like Jay and the Americans. Um, only in America, right? Yeah. Only in America was written for the drifters, Right. But when they thought about it, they said, oh, we can't have a black act sing this song only in America because it's it's not true, you know, only in America. Yeah, right. You know, it, BS, <laughs> you know, yet all the white artists were emulating the black artists because they had the they had that God given gospel blues R&B talent. And everybody yeah. said, we love that. I want to do that, you know. Look at the British invasion. Well, what was this? It was just a reflection of of yeah. American artists. Uh, who was slighted, you know. That's why kudos to uh, to a guy like Felix Cavalieri and the Rascals, you know. Felix made sure that all his opening acts were black artists, you know. That's good. That's really good. You know, he had a conscience, you know. So, you, you know, listen, you, you take it one day at a time. 
but there's no way. I mean, Balance did very limited touring. We did Fog Hat, Boston, a few acts and things like this. But Balance didn't get the support from the label. That's terrible. And, you know, and um, they lost they lost the record and stuff like that. We ended up uh, having more of a base in Europe than in the United States, you know, Um you know, so you just got to you just got to roll with the punches. Fortunately for me, I fell into the jingle business in New York. And I did that for 20 years. And that allowed me to be a musician with a pension. What a novel idea. <laughs> Good thing you did that. But what was what, the Balance album? What was that like? I mean, because uh, I never heard. I only heard the single because, you know, like oh. it's in the U.S. What oh. is the album like? And can you get it? Because I would love to. Yeah, you can probably find it online somewhere. The first album was just called Balance, and the second album was called In For The Count. And they are state-of-the-art, a musician's musician's band. Nice. You know, um, if uh, if ever you want to listen to just the top of the line, first class, AOR, rock and roll, hands down, it's, you know, the contemporaries are Journey and Foreigner. You know, uh, we were in that bag, and... Although we didn't have the luck and the success of it, we were every bit as good and every bit as polished. Sure. And um, Tony Bon Jovi co-produced with us at the Power Station in New York. And, um, you know, I mean, really, on the first album, who did we have? We had Andy Newmark, Willie Weeks. You know, they were a Reef Martin's rhythm section for every great record that ever came out, you know? Right. And so, you know, they were, they were like, like, Come on, they played on 20, 30 top 10 records. You know, like the Wrecking were, Crew for the 60s. Same type yeah. of thing. Just yeah. like newer ones. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, I, you know, the Magoos were great. I mean, we toured on the first tour that broke the Who in the United States. And it was the Blues Magoos, Herman's Hermits, and the Who. And we went out for the whole summer of 1967, you know, and... It was mayhem. It was, well, mayhem because, you know, Keith Moon. <laughs> so so I have got a million Keith Moon stories because I was the only jerk who would still go out with him after he trashed rooms and hotels and oh, uh, cracked, cracked lamps over people's heads and everything else like that. And then even I just said, like, okay, I'd, I want to live. So you're not going to go out with Keith anymore. <laughs> You know, but I have I have been writing a book for years. It's called the, it's going to be called The Prince of McDougal Street. And because the Night Owl Cafe was on third and McDougal. And uh, so, you know, my Keith Moon stories will show up in there uh, for sure. And, and stuff like that. And, you know, it's hard for me to write it because I'm still living it. You know, yeah. So, is that still is that still there? The, uh, the, 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 the no, the Night Owl Cafe ended up being a Japanese restaurant after it was Bleaker Bob's for like 30 years. Oh, wow. It was it became a record store. Uh, but that's like hollowed ground to me. So, you know, but uh, because uh, I was a kid, uh, the, another funny one is, you know, I left home at 14. So I was not allowed to be out on the street. Right. I was not allowed to be living on my own. I was allowed, not allowed to be out of school. So I literally was on stage one night. I saw two detectives walk into the door because I'm a street kid. So I know the difference between guys walking in plain clothes that are <laughs> six foot four and six foot three, looking like totally out of place in hippie land with my mother calling me, telling me they're going to put me away in a place uh, called the Children's Village in Dobbs Ferry because I'm a truant, mm -hmm. you know, in a reformatory. And I see these guys walk into the door and I go, oh, and I know immediately the detectives looking for me to take me back to this place. I run off the stage in the middle of a song at 14 years old. I run off the stage. I ran out the back door of the Night Out Cafe, up over the roof, climb over a roof into another building, come down in another building wow. in the staircase and run and leave. And now I got the fear of God in me. By the grace of by the grace of God, two months later, the truant officer finds me. He didn't look like a detective, and he was a nice guy. So I figured, okay, he's talking to me like, what gives? You know, I knew something was up. And then he finally tells me, like, listen, this is what I am, and this is who I am. I don't want to hurt you, but we have to resolve something here, or you're going to be sitting the next two years in a reformatory, <laughs> you know? And so I listened to him. So he goes, listen, would you... Would your parent, because I only had my mom, uh, would your parent co-sign 
a, 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 a release form for you if I can get you legally signed out of the school system. Because in New York, in New York laws, you could legally be signed out of school at 16 with your parents' consent. Correct. So I go to him, I say, yeah, I think she would. And he goes, that's great, great. Okay, good, good. He goes, he goes oh, when are you going to be 16? And my, my face drops because I'm 14. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know. So I look at him. I go, uh, "I'm I'm going to be 15 in three months." And then his face drops. You know what this guy did? This guy brought me back to deal with Clinton High School in the Bronx three weeks before my 15th birthday and forged my birthday, forged my birth certificate, and got me signed out of the school system before I hit my 15th birthday. So he must have saw something in you because, you know, you've broken every rule. <laughs> well, I was playing. And look at how successful you became. Listen, listen, I was playing four <laughs> sets a night at, at the Night Owl Cafe living at the Hotel Albert in Greenwich Village, you know. So he, he knew I wasn't on the street. Right. You know, uh, but that man, God bless him, he changed my life. God, wow, he, he saved my life. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I've heard he passed away and I've lost touch with his daughter Aww. and and forget his name even now. But, you know, the universe knows how much I love that guy. And the, the fact that, you know, he he literally saved my life and my career it was one of those one of those aha moments that allowed me to go on. You know, that's an uh, impressive story. What about what about the instruments you play? You said you play a little bit of guitar. What else do you play? Well, you know, when you're in bands for 50 years, you know. And it started with the Magoos, you know. I had a thirst for knowledge, even though I didn't. But I wanted to learn what I wanted to learn and not what they were gonna trying to tell me. Right. I had to learn and, and, and to be compliance, you know. So every time I'd strum a chord on a guitar, I'd go over to Ralph on the keyboard. I'd go, what is this for you? If this is what it is for me, what is this for you, you know? And then I started getting into uh, the keyboard and started transferring things that I knew on guitar on the piano. And then I loved the musicality of the piano and the fact that, you know, in a guitar, everything's like linear it's this way, but on the piano, it's like laid out right in front of you, you know, you see it all there. <laughs> and so the melodics, and so my writing became um, dominant on piano for many, many, many years. And it is even, it is even now, because I not only embraced instruments, I embraced the technology that came in, you know, with the sequencing and the digital recording Correct. and all the software and that kind of stuff. So I was very fortunate in that respect. And uh, bass became a natural. You know, same thing with drums. I had tons of rhythm. I loved rhythm. So, yeah. you know, I'd be like, hey, let me go. Okay, how do you play this beat? What is this, you know? So after 50 years of that, you know, I'm a little Prince McCartney kind of guy that, that, that travels in that kind of realm that when I look at tape or the, the digital realm, it's like a painting to me, you know? And so I take all the colors and I use all the colors and I fill up the paper. And at the end of the day, you know, I have my song and I'm playing all the instruments and I'm singing all the parts. And if I want to have other people play cameos, that's great. Like for instance, Balance is a band. So because I'm doing a one-off with Balance, we lost a member. We lost a, a guy named Bob Kulik this year, who uh, was, is Bruce Kulik's brother. Bruce was in Kiss for 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, 13 years. And uh, so I have Bruce, playing his brother's, taking over his brother's slot for this for this tribute record. I went and called Chuck, who was the drummer on the last album, and I said, would you play? I'd like to get as many of the original people together, and I'd like to make some kind of a tribute and put a one-off, then to put in a little cap for myself and things like that. So, you know, it's, uh, so I do use other people, uh, and um, I've collaborated on, on Warhol and things like that. Uh, but I, I love, I love playing, but all of it has always been the, the, the end to justify the means. It was always, again, learning the studio stuff was so that I didn't have to pay 150 bucks at one o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock in the morning for studio time in New York at the best studio, because I wanted to record my songs, you know, right, right you right. know. I would do all the pre-production I could so that I didn't have to waste time in the studio and waste my money because I was always self-financing myself because presentation is everything and you didn't you don't advance 
as a musician unless you have a great presentation and you can go to the powers that be and say, hey, do you like these songs? And they go, yeah, I love them. I love you. Hey, you're great. I want to sign you. You know, that kind of that kind of mentality is all, all the stuff that had to do. So my writing is my musicality. You know, I don't consider myself um, a musician's musician. Some people do, but that's based on what's up in here and the things I hear and the things that I write. So, you know, I've always approached myself as a songwriter and, um, and those are my babies, you know, those are the, the songs of what I have. The, I mean, to think I still see checks for, we ain't got nothing yet. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> 55 years later. That's insane. But that's, that's, even, even though it's, even though it's a buck three eighty, you know, but, <laughs> but, at any point in time, somebody come come out of the woodwork and say, you know, we like that song. We're going to put it in a movie or we're going to put it in this, you know. And you go like, oh, my God, it's like the gift that keeps on giving, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it, it, it's crazy, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, my jingle career was great. I toughed it out. I stayed in there 20 years and I was still able to do balance and do other things and write songs for other people. Wow, what and, an amazing career you've had. Just amazing. And and make records. So, you know, that's that's great. You know, Gene Simmons was really instrumental in a lot of things to me. He's been he's been such a sweet cat to me. Um, you know, I still talk to Paul all the time. We we, you know, I called him up the other day and just said, Okay, man, congrats. You know, he's got this new um, yeah, he's he's got this new R and B classics, and you see, but Paul's smart enough to know that even though he's going to do retreads on some of the great old songs that he was weaned on, he's smart enough to say, you know, and I'll write five songs of my own and put it in the package, because there's where the money is for him that in the publishing and and the and the writers' rights. So, you know, they're so iconic, but Gene. Uh, was the guy who turned me on to Diana Ross. I had two huge B-sides with Diana Ross. I had the B-side of uh, Missing You. Ooh, I'm missing you. Tell me where the road turns. Good song. Great song. You know, great song. Yeah. And, you know, and I had the B-side on that single with a song I wrote called We Are the Children of the World, right? Now, the song was going to come out. I'm saying, great, I got the B-side of Diana Ross's next single. This is fabulous. Great. It tanks at 50. And I'm going, oh, you know, I'm like, all right. And I'm saying, oh, okay, you know. And it was about Marvin Gaye. It was an ode to Marvin Gaye and the way he, the way he died, you right. know. And so, so I said, okay, well, you know, live and let learn. That was good. You had a good shot. You thought it was that, you know. And then she went on the Academy Awards and sang it. And in two weeks, it was top 10. That's so, amazing. That's so, amazing. you know, you talk about luck, timing, and talent and the power of TV and the medium. And that, that's it. All she had to do. And then they, and then um, I had the B-side of Swept Away. Swept Away! Nothing lasts forever! And Daryl, who's an old buddy, Daryl Hall wrote Swept Away. You know? And again, you know, um, I had a song called Fight For It because Diana loved the song I wrote for her and she called me and she said, would you write with me? I went like, uh, no. <laughs> Well, I got, I got no, to... Diana. You're you're a screaming <laughs> rapacious swamp sow, and I want nothing to do with you. You know, it's like, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, you know. Peppy, I got a couple comments here. Debbie says that uh, Deborah uh, Milstein says Bobby Nathan, who was at her house, when Steve Katz was there, owned a big rec recording studio in New York City. She wanted to let you know. Oh well, I was there. I know Bobby before he even owned the recording studio. Awesome. Yeah. And my friend John Wagner said he does glass art of kiss photos, handmade. If anybody knew, he would like you to tell Gene or Paul that he does that. That he does what? Handmade? He, he does glass art. In other words, he etches glass oh. with their pictures. Well, you know what? He should. Um, uh... He has no way of getting in touch with them. And he and he's actually uh, he actually works with me. He's part of my crew. Well, send me an email on him. I will. I'll send, send I'll send information, John, to you about Pepe, and then you can uh, talk to him about it. I lost your audio, Pepe. I my my history is what they call it, is such because I I I was instrumental in Ace Freely's um, learning guitar. 
you know. I didn't, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> more, more peppy. More trivia. stuff for the book, yes. right? <laughs> I am, I am Ace's earliest influence, and I taught him how to play some guitar. Yeah. So, you know, so, uh, you know, that's groundbreaking. I mean, you know, it was nice enough to put me in his book and give me give me the kudos on that. And and I've seen him say that in uh, interviews and stuff like that. But that that's why, you know, the Kiss fans are like, you taught Ace Freely how to play guitar. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> so, uh, you know, but maybe there's something there with your buddy and Ace with glass and stuff like because he's the space guy, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So you know, but uh, you know, you have my email, so you, you can send me anything. Um, I mean, I am a, a text and a phone call away. Yeah, but but, but, but but what you don't like to do, and this is what I always say. Um, I mean, Liberty is the same way. Liberty, oh, just say anything, any whatever to do. Listen, no, but what we don't like to do in the business is, oh, I've got a friend that does this, and I got a friend to do that. I don't like to do that because <laughs> you know. Sometimes things go sour and oh, you yeah, feel course. like people want to pressure you to do things that you oh, can't really oh, do. It happens please, all the time. please, please. I, I'd be a much more wealthier man had I been able to accommodate half half of the, 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 Hey, can you do this? Can you do this? For me? I know. Can, can you get so-and-so to sign this? Can you do that? And, you know, it's like, I'm a friggin' dork. Like veal cutlet, but they want me because they want Paul to sign something, or Ace See, to sign not... something, or Joey Kramer from Aerosmith right, to sign right, something, right. or this one, or can you get me in to see this? Can you get me a signed picture, please, sent to my grandmother? You know, I mean, it's like it never ends. And even in my jingle career, I got to tell you, you know, there was an old, there's an old adage there, the years and years ago, that if you did, um, if you did, uh, um, uh, a commercial, you were a sellout, right? You were you were selling out, you know. Right. And and I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, art art is when you sit at home and you write a song. The minute you take that song out of your house to do anything with it, you are in the capitalistic realm. And I used to tell people, I said, you you're full of BS because there are no bigger who is in the world than the record companies. So, yeah. you know, I said, so what it is. And then sure enough, every single week of my jingle career, I would have singers, recording artists, musicians, yep. recording artists begging me, can I get them in? You know? And I was like, listen, man, I didn't knock on a door. I got asked in. And I said, it's almost like if you have to ask, you're out, you know, because you don't, you don't get, you don't ask into those businesses where people are earning a livelihood every single day. Exactly. And the and the best people in the world are being used. I mean, my sessions every day. Who was on my sessions? Oh, okay, Will Lee, Paul Schaefer, yeah, Anton Fig, you know, Steve Gadd, you know, big names, yeah, big names. The first choice musicians because they were the guys that could come into the studio, read a chart, knock out the song in thirty minutes as opposed to band member guys that would come in and maybe took two hours to struggle through it. Yeah. So, you know, so it's a very, very fickle business, you know, but uh, again, I'm one of those guys that I'm lucky enough. I became like a little freak of nature, you know, because I can sit, even in my jingle career, you know, I wrote a spot um, for soft and dry, right? If you're not a little nervous, then you're not alive. Just because something's hard to do doesn't mean that you won't try. Well, if you want to stay cool, soft and dry, boom. Come on, soft and dry, boom. I remember that, yeah. Right? So I wrote this spot. They, they, The agency came to my mu the music house I worked with, and they said, well, we don't know what we want, but we just want it. We want, it, we want, we want people to know that, you know, soft and dry, if you're nervous about sweating situations, that soft and dry keep you cool and calm and collected and, you know, put this under your arm and you're going to be just great, you know? And so I wrote the whole thing from scratch. I recorded all the instruments. I did everything myself. And then it went on to air. And I said... Great. They took my spot. Oh, my God. They didn't call Willie and these guys in. They took exactly what I did and they put it on the air. Well, you know what? I got paid as eight musicians. That's I so got, cool. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I got my creator's fee. You know, uh, you know, I, I did hire a fabulous female singer because they wanted a female to sing it, you know, and stuff like that. But I, I was like, 
okay, this works. I like this. This is pretty cool, you know. So, you know, so it's just you live and learn. You the twist and turns. You never know where it's going to come from. It's like I had no idea Steve Lieber was going to call me up and say, "Hey, you want to take a shot at Wall?" You know, he was dealing with the biggest of the big. But what happened was he had a guy named Stephen Schwartz write six songs. Now, Stephen Schwartz was signed with Sir Trevor Nunn and Rupert Holmes to do the book. Stephen Schwartz wrote, uh, he's the composer for Wicked, for Godspell. Wow. For Pippin, you know, I mean, these guys are icons. And so I'm going, Steve, what, what are you calling me for? You know, like, what happened to Stephen Schwartz? He said, well, Stephen wants to control the whole thing. He wants to control all music. He goes, and I'm not having it. I'm the guy that paid the million bucks to the Warhol Foundation for the options. So he goes, no, this is my baby. And so, you know, so if you want to take a stab, take a stab. And then I took Sir Trevor Nunn's lyrics uh, uh, with a buddy of mine in balance, a guy named Doug Gutzaris, who's beyond brilliant. And um, so now I have bona fide six songs in the show and I'm like, okay, great. So you, you know, you just don't know where it's going to come from, but it does come. And thankfully I have nothing to prove to anybody. No, you, know? you don't. <laughs> You've and, done everything and, and everything. Anymore. I've survived since I'm 14 years old in a business that eats you up and spits you out. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, so, uh, you know, it's like if wall happens, great. If it doesn't, I really don't give a shit. <laughs> You can add it to your resume as a good thing or whatever, you know? You know, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm just happy. I, I love that. I have, I love, I have wonderful friends and people in my life. And, you know, I love being able to sit out on the beach or out by the pool here or go up to my house. I got a house built in 1760. I live below my means so that I can live on a pension, you know? Uh, but, you know, it's like, Really, I don't have anything to prove. So it's it's a funny place to be because when I'm younger, you know, I had everything to prove. You know, you're 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 batting down doors, you're 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 jumping at hoops to for any opportunity possible and stuff like that. It's not that I'm a fat cat or an icon or anything. It's uh, just, you know, I have peace. You know, no, I, I, I think I think you're just a, like a real world person, but you just, just <laughs> I'm average, out of my mind. <laughs> no, but you're an average guy to me because I listen, I understand what you're saying. And when you look at yourself at a higher elevation, you know, people of course all do, and I'm sure I, you know a lot of people say that, but you are there, but right, I still see you as a regular guy from you know from where you grew up. That's and it. and, and That's you it. just were successful. And yeah. you're proving to people they can be successful and you've helped people be successful. So you've done literally everything that a person would need to do, make it in the business, be successful to help other people. And then just keep creating what you're doing. Cause well, you're not going to stop. Well, I got to tell you throughout my career, I went through things to where I saw people who I know and love, but they were like, Oh no, no, you can't hang out with that guy. Oh, you can't do this. Or you know, and it, it was like, you know, we're like, uh, 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 you know, we're certain people we're on this level. You can't get down with the worker bees. You have to be, you know, up this. And I saw lots of friends and people, you know, they wouldn't consider even going out with a normal person. It had to be somebody that was on in their station in yeah. life. And, you know, and where I want to be a power couple and all that, which is fine if that's what works for him i don't judge it but that wasn't me you know that no you don't, you don't you don't uh, seem like that type of guy let's talk a little bit about hair because <laughs> hair was a huge musical you know of course the castles we met actually in, uh, susan castle and uh, one of the castles i think still left one of the the, the her brother oh, no no they're there the castles are there i saw them just recently um because i inducted jimmy rado into the Rochester Music Hall of Fame. Jimmy was one of the, um, uh, uh, I'm supposed to be someplace because I thought we were going to do four o'clock. So um, I, I got to, I'm just. Oh, we, can, we can end it whenever you're ready, brother. I'm no, no, good. No, I'm, I'm just trying to text my. I don't want to, I don't want to set you off. I don't want no, no problem. No, it's just a matter of me giving him a quick shout out and say, hey, I'm doing the interview now. <laughs> you know. We'll be uh, done in probably another 10 minutes because we went a little bit. Short. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. That's it. Just bear with me one second. But um, hair was absolutely. Uh, let's see. Okay, bum 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 bum. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'll tell you the good, bad, and ugly. Anything you want to know about hair, for sure. 
Well, you worked with uh, the, the the cast in Hair too, right? You did Don Dacus. I was a principal actor in in Hair on Broadway for a year and a half. So I wasn't a musician in it playing. I was an actual a singing, dancing actor on Broadway for a year and a half. Okay. Uh, you know, seven shows a week. Let me the, the and um. So you actually did the one live in Broadway. You you didn't do the movie. You did the, the no, no. I was in the original Broadway production. Oh, okay. For, uh, for 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 a year and a half, and um, yeah, that was before the movie existed. That's what fed the movie. That's what fed the fact that there was going to be a movie because the show was so successful, you know, and um, and that was great, man. That was uh, eight shows a week on Broadway. Come Monday, I collapse. Uh, two and a half hours running around on a stage like Tarzan swinging from a vine onto the <laughs> stage with hardly anything on a wireless mic in your hand and 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 walking around Broadway and having families come up to you going, oh, my God, we saw you last night, you know, because they couldn't miss you because, you know, I looked like a tree, you know. <laughs> You know, so it's like, oh, that's, you know, it's not like you're almost wondering, is that the guy you saw last night? There's no doubt about it. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because anybody that was walking around Broadway back then, and, you know, if you did matinees and things like that, yeah, you went out, you went out to Joe Allen's or certain clubs and, you know, certain places, and you had yourself a bite to eat, and then you went back and you did the the, the, the night show and stuff like that. But for a year and a half, whew, it was a long, it was a long run. You know, and it was a great, great um, experience. It was an amazing experience, you know. But, the, you know, it was crazy because they, they were toxic times. And, you know, we had speed freaks, junkies, gays. The black girl did all the, the, the apricot brandy before they went. The, 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 the white chicks were popping speed to get through, you know, time release speed to get through eight shows a week, you know. It was wow. crazy, you know. Yeah. I was smoking real joints on stage. I mean, you know, it was like, ah! <laughs> and guess what? 50 years later, it's legal. <laughs> yeah, 50, 50 years later, I'm as straight as an arrow. I do absolutely nothing. I don't, I don't even take any kind of meds or anything. I mean, I, I'm I'm like completely organic. Good, you know? that's good. It's like, and I'm high on life, so thank God that happened, you know. Because by all rights, I mean, listen, I grew up in rooms with Timothy Leary, yeah. and you know, in the village with, with, I was like the baby back then, but they shuttled me around, you know, and, uh, you know, oh my God, the, 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 the pot stories and the, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's just, it was just crazy because, you know, the Magoos, we would get searched and strip searched everywhere we went because these are a psychedelic rock and roll band. So, like, they didn't pound the gear. You know, you'd have to sit in an airport for three hours while oh, they strip searched you and they did all this stuff. And I'd be telling them, guys, listen, you don't understand. It's the guys with the crew cuts that are smuggling. <laughs> <laughs> it's not us fucking hippies. We just yeah. smoke the shit, you know. <laughs> but the, the real guys you want are the guys that are running around with the crew cuts. And that's probably know? the truth, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was. It was. Let me tell you. <laughs> it's the opposite of what they think. Yeah, and they didn't smoke a thing, but they liked making their money, you know. The smuggling smuggling stuff in two-man submarines from Hawaii, you know, uh, buying and selling companies. For all foil, you know this. this, this you know, <laughs> big, the big stuff, the big stuff, stuff that just makes you go, "What?" You yeah, know? but it never ends. It's all relative. I mean, look at the world today, right? Are we not in like the craziest insanity ever? Yeah. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. What have you been doing since COVID? Just uh, singing, singing, you know, party, well, relaxing. Yeah. Listen, you know, some people hate that I'm in Florida. I love that I'm in Florida because it's the freest place on earth right now. Some people say, oh, you're you're only making it worse. You know, I'm like, <laughs> uh, no, you know, I got my N95. I got my Purell. I keep my distance. I walk around. But I like being able to go to a restaurant and a table and sit outside and be six feet away. You know, I like being able to go to the beach. You know, I like having some sense of normalcy, normal life. You know, I mean, look, when I go fly, I'm going up to New York on the 14th. It's probably my seventh trip to New York via Palm Beach, 
you know, PBI uh, 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 airport to any one of the airports in New York, you know, mm -hmm. what, what do you have to do? I have to stand six feet apart on a security line that takes now twice as long, mm -hmm. okay, to get through and keep my distance, keep my mask on to what? To sit on an airplane packed. Yeah. Sold out with people and next to me here. And again, me again nothing makes sense, does it? No. no. Why, why does one make sense and the other doesn't make sense? I don't it's, understand it's, that. it's the tail wagging the dog, you know? It's like it's, it's money. It's all money. But, yeah, well, listen, we know, yes, absolutely. The, at the end of the day, it comes down to the Benjamins. It comes down to Big Pharma, the corporations, the media conglomerates, the propaganda, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. It does not matter. It does not matter. Control, compliance. I mean, you call it what you want, you know. Me, I put love out. There's no politics on my Facebook page. I Beautiful. Put, I put love out into the world because there's not never enough love. You know, my songs have a conscience, you know, I'm no more. I'm not writing songs that are negative. I write songs that are positive. I got a little thing I put out um, called The Color of Life, which is on YouTube. If anybody wants to go look at Pepe Castle, The Color of Life, it'll come up. It's my demo because really what I'm at, I'm at the point now to where I'm trying to get a um, a global cast of kids from all over the world right? Um, for rocking the planet. Cause it's, it's a beautiful message. I don't have adults do the show. I have kids do the show, you know, preteens and teenagers and nice. they are just, they're just magical. They, they light up, you know, I did it in San Antonio two years ago, won a, a San Antonio global award uh, for it. The kids are magnificent. I uh, found a purpose that I love cause kids just, you know, they, they, the world hasn't eaten them up and spit them out yet, you know? And so, you know, but I, I do things for myself and I just, you know, I, I just enjoy it. I don't hurt anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to be hurt. You know, I go about life. There's not a lot, not enough love in the world. And, you know, but these are dark times. Like for me, do I ever think I'm going to see New York go back to being the way it was within my lifetime? No, I don't. I don't, I don't see how that's possible. You know, it's not New York anymore. You know, the restaurants are in the streets. Yeah, that's the uh, same way here in New Jersey. It's, 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 it's it, you know, the, the, the virus actually goes to sleep at 10 o'clock. And my one friend said, and I said, well, I, I don't, yeah. I don't agree with that. But in some form, you're right, because they shut the bars down at 10 o'clock and yeah. all the moms and pops can have to cl close, but all the other businesses are open. And again, I don't understand. They've been killed. And the, th and the difference is, is, whether you like the Florida numbers or you don't like the Florida numbers, yes, you know what? Is Florida um, up there with Texas and New York and, and California? Absolutely, because that's they are the big conglomerates of New York. But Florida is under attack because yeah. everybody's coming here. Hollywood yeah. is coming here. The yeah. Hollywood studios, they're booking. They're coming to Miami. They're coming to Hollywood, Florida. New York is infiltrated by New York liberal Democrats that don't want to deal with New York because they're wealthy enough. They don't care. They're booking. They're out of there. They're all coming down here, you know. Um, so there's an overload. There's an abundance. You can't keep – you can't – if I want to sell my apartment, I can sell it in a day <laughs> down here. I believe it's, that. It's, I believe it's, that. Oh, it's true. It's true. There's a boom in, in, in insanity down here. So – you know, unfortunately, Florida ends up being in line with all the places that did lock down, and they didn't, you know. So who knows anymore, you know. I give it up to the universe, you know. And I do, too. I do, too. I do, too. At the end of the day, you know what? I have a phrase. The universe always wins. So whatever's going on down here is just, you know, we're just all crawling all over each other trying to make sense of it, you know. I'm writing a song now called Just Another Day to Get It Right. I like that. I like the, like the sound of that. You know, and I'm writing that because that's what Richie Havens used to say. Hey, man, just another day to get it right. That's what he would tell me. You know, uh, Richie and I were very close. You know, I, I met him when I was 14. He, he sang me w one of the most amazing songs I've ever heard in my life. Just he and I at 14 years old. And from then on, I was like, oh, my God. The, you know, like I'm in love with this man, you know, and so and we stayed friends over the years and stuff like that. And that was one of Richie's phrases: "Just another day to get it right." 
<laughs> you know, and that's really all we have. You yeah, know, very true. We we've got the moment, and it's just another day to get right. You know, because the more we know, the more we know we don't know. You know You're right. Some, You're right. Some sometimes the answer is there is no answer. You know, and when people say, "Oh, it's uh, the secret to life." They say that because it's a secret. <laughs> well, I just want to offer you this opportunity, my my friend. Uh, yeah, Joe, life is good. Life is good, man. So life much stuff going on. So much stuff going on. Ooh. So I want to give you uh, time to tell people where they can find you, where they can get your okay. music, and everywhere. Good. Let's say where you can find you can find me floating around the universe somewhere. Uh, you can email me at. Peppy, P E P P Y, the letter C, Peppy C at O P T online.net, Peppy C at opt online.net. You can find me on one of two Facebook pages. My personal one's maxed out. That's ridiculous. There's like hundreds and hundreds of people I haven't even responded to yet because I can't. And, right. you know, that's uh, over the 5,000 mark. But the, the official one, which I guess I can have as many as others, I don't promote myself i don't i don't um you know i don't boost i don't do this i don't do that i'm just living if if you love my music i'm um i'm as happy as sin you know there's nothing like being validated and appreciated but uh you know you can find me on facebook uh my website is there but i don't even use it anymore you know it's like it's got dated material on it. but peppy see it opt and the, the facebook official page is probably the best way to get in touch with me and we can go from there and uh you'll send me to glass guy and uh, the glass menagerie and we'll <laughs> and we'll <laughs> i will i will can you do uh, a sweeper for me too would i do a what a sweeper or a liner for me absolutely just all you have to say is you who you are and yeah. say you're listening to uh, Hamilton Radio. That's fine. So what is it? Oh, say, Hamilton. Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, Hamilton, it, it did, I did this 25 years. Come on. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> okay, you ready? Go ahead. Hey, this is Pepe Castro, the legend in his own mind, wishing you happiness, joy, and peace, and levity. And if you don't listen to Hamilton Radio, you are missing out because it rocks like a big dog in space. I love you, brother. It was All right, man. Have you back sometime. Hey, anytime, this man. Thing comes anytime, out. anytime, anytime, and and thank to our mutual friend there, uh, our, our, uh, you know, uh, for uh, for putting us together. Deborah Milstein's great. Yeah, yeah, course. yeah. I'm sure she's listening, and laughing, and all this. She stuff. is. She is. Yeah, Deborah, it. fight the good fight. Stay with the program. <laughs> I know sometimes you vacillate, and sometimes you can tend to be depressed and stuff like that. But just remember, if you're bored, you're boring. That's true. <laughs> There's always another another day, to, like you said. The next day we'll get it right. Let's do that. Just another day to get it right. Keep the faith. All Thank right, you, Gene. brother. Thanks for being my, here. Have my a great pleasure, day. buddy. All Thank right, you. man. You too, man. All right. All right bye bye. bye.